You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I feel like who art ed? Try to spice it. Who art is Mr. Wood <laughs> art ed me? Yeah. Either way, it, it, it's ambiguous. It works on so many levels. I know. That's off to a great start. Welcome to Who Arted, where we explore visual arts in an audio medium. I'm your host, Kyle Wood, and joining me once again, I have my old friend, friend of the pod, a teacher's teacher, Mr. David Pittman. Thanks for joining me. No problem. I'm so excited to be back. And I thought you were the perfect person to talk to because this gets into a little bit of not only art, but also math concepts that are probably a little bit over my head. Um, (laughs) We are talking about... M.C. Escher. And longtime listeners would know pronouncing names is not exactly my forte. And this is a habit that goes back a long time for me. I vividly remember one of my first encounters with M.C. Escher. Um, I was going, I was like a kid, probably 10 years old, going to the mall to pick up a poster to hang on my wall. And I remember going into the poster store and asking, do you have any stuff by McKesher? <laughs> and <laughs> to their credit, the teenager who was working in the store found a way to not laugh at me for that. And <laughs> sorry, <laughs> <laughs> she was just like, oh, the Escher section is over here. <laughs> nice. Um, but you his work go through a McDonald's drive through and ask for the McKesher. <laughs> Yes, but uh, his work his work has been um, beloved by generations of teens and college students and stuff like that. People who generally like stuff that's a little bit psychedelic, a little bit trippy, but also like really, really precise and methodical. It's a, it's an odd combination there. M. C. Escher, uh, Mortis Cornelius Escher. I can see why he went with M. C. He was born June 17th, 1898 in Leeuwarden, Friesland, the Netherlands. Let's just say the Netherlands because I never want to try to pronounce those names again. I'm sure my listeners in the Netherlands are like just cringing right now. But (laughs) as a kid, (laughs) as a kid, he was sickly and he was placed like in a special school. While he was skilled in drawing, he struggled quite a bit academically. Um, I guess he failed the second grade and throughout his education, he struggled. So he went to he went to school for art and design. Specifically, he started out pursuing architecture, but he was not doing great academically. He, I guess, failed some classes. And one of his teachers really urged him to switch to the decorative arts, learning skills like woodcut printing. So then 1922, he's done with school. He starts traveling and he goes to Italy and Spain. And he was particularly impressed with like the Moorish architecture, 14th century palaces and fortresses. Like before this period and before this travel, he was largely focused on landscapes. Like he loved the Italian countryside and he was making just kind of straight up landscapes. But this experience looking at the architecture, like we we have his drawings. He was copying the tessellations that he saw, the ornate tile work that was just all over. And if you have been in those old historical buildings, like it is just an amazing experience being surrounded by so much elaborate tile work and these these ornate designs. Yeah, I mean, I think it's I, I was just taken by this transition of him from this kid who we, we see this in today's education, like academically is struggling and then like but just really attuned to detail, finding his way to that wood cutting, which if you've ever cut a piece of wood. I mean, like, you know, it was difficult to like being inspired by these uh, these tessellations, which, you know, unbeknownst to him or maybe beknownst to him, you know, like were the some of the foundations in the Moorish culture of 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 math. Some of our deep, deep roots come come from there. So that's it was just uh, amazing that he found his way, even though academically it's like it probably was tagged as not uh, going to be delving into things that were quote mathematical, even though for him it was art. 
Yeah, for him, his understanding of math and geometry seems to be somewhat intuitive. Like he was drawn to these tessellations. And I guess, you know, for clarity, I should define some terms. A tessellation is a pattern of, of interlocking shapes. Basically, the pieces fit together with no gaps in between. And he was doing, he was in, inspired by that kind of work, um, particularly in Islamic traditions, there's a lot of tessellated patterns and designs, non-figurative work um, in the religious context because of the Islamic faith and tradition of not doing figurative representational work for religious reasons. And so in that avenue, like the Islamic artists were doing stuff that was just jaw-droppingly beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, you start to focus on one thing because you're not doing something else. And, you know, that was inspiring to Escher and a number of other artists. And it totally transformed the way he approached art. He started doing stuff like he started focusing a little bit on metamorphosis. And, you know, he was doing a bit of a metamorphosis himself. You know, early Escher work, as I said, was largely inspired by landscapes, sort of traditional decorative motifs. And then he started to, he started down a path towards these geometric patterns, like I said, inspired by the tile work he saw on Moorish castles and stuff from like the 14th century. And he started exploring this idea of making patterns but the figures changed over the course of the piece. So from a distance, it may look sort of like a standard tessellated pattern, but the shapes are recognizable figures, and they're altered slightly with each repetition until they become something entirely different. So I'm looking at um, one of his pieces here where on the left-hand side, it looks like black and white bird silhouettes that then become sort of cubes and then become a cityscape. And then it's like by the right side, they're chess pieces. Mm. And he somehow gets that transition, that evolution to happen all in one unified drawing. And I think, I think that is kind of an amazing thing, just like as an artist who always looks at works of art thinking like, well, how would I do that? Um, it's just an impressive technical feat to get all of that unified. Right. And, and, and you know, I, when you, when I, when you gave me this information, cause I did not know this about MC or Mick Escher, um, <laughs> you know, I was like, he did landscapes. Like I thought the tessellations, you know, I thought all of the, the, those kind of pieces. And so I went and like looked up some of those, like, I'm like, I want to see what these landscapes look like. And I love this piece that you chose with the transition from the birds to the cubes to the buildings to that. Because when you look at his actual landscapes, it's like he – you can see the, like, the the foundation of that pattern finding or, like, you mm-hmm. know, how patterns, like, merge into each other. Um, and I'm looking at just one that's, like, a, a – a, a seaside cliffside city kind of like what is in this tessellation even like that one of those on a sea coast kind of village where those those buildings are and you can see where he's he's working with how do i find um patterns in the natural and then how do i merge those together so it creates this landscape and it's it's pretty awesome to see that evolution of his work yeah and i mean nothing against his landscapes per se but i as someone who looked at them, it's like, I kind of just felt like they were fine. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they weren't, they weren't terrible, but there was nothing really inspired about them. And I think when he, when he started to experiment with the, the tiling, the tessellations, the, the transformations, I mean, his work and he transformed in a lot of ways. We see he starts to become more imaginative. He's not doing stuff so much from observation, but more uh, conceptually driven. So in his life, you know, 1935, he had been in Italy, loved the countryside, loved the landscape, was not super fond of the fascists. So he left. He wasn't like a political person, but 
he recognized like Mussolini, not so great, doesn't want to be a part of that. So he goes to Switzerland, but he didn't really like it in Switzerland all that much. Um, he was there for like two years, but not super happy in that in that setting either. And he eventually sort of moved back to the Netherlands during World War II, and he stayed there from 1941 to 1970. That's kind of the period where all of his best-known pieces were produced. Mm. I always find it interesting because today, Escher's a pretty well-known commodity. He's a pretty famous artist. But in his day, and looking back, like this kind of makes sense – he was not super popular in like the fine art world. I, I kind of get the sense he was one of those artists that people just, they didn't know how to categorize him because he wasn't this interesting flamboyant character like a Salvador Dali or um, a Pablo Picasso. You know, a lot of sort of the avant-garde artists, their personality and their antics were almost a part of their brand. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we and we see this today still publicity stunts and celebrities who do outlandish things to get attention. Escher was not one of those guys. Escher was the kind of guy who just quietly and methodically went about his work. And this is the kind of thing that I really can kind of relate to, because as somebody who has struggled, I think the way a struggling person succeeds is through patience and persistence and hard work and taking the time to just understand the systems mm-hmm. and understand a process and just go about that. Yeah, he it, it's it's like the the person who's just quietly working in in the corner and isn't um, so aware of self of who they have to be or or that they have to like get to some like uh, societal impose like oh i have to be like you know i have to be dolly i have to be because i have to fulfill this this role that people want of me and he was just i just want to do this um i want to get better at it i'm not gonna i'm not gonna live up to an image i'm just gonna continually learn and continually grow and not show everyone how great i am i'm just gonna let the work speak for itself yeah and i, I like the way that i as somebody who has never met him, talked to him, or anything like that, but will still be, um, you know, the after the fact psychologist analyzing him. I just think like he's the kind of person that probably with those early failures and stumbling blocks, he just didn't have the ego to be out there in his personal life and behavior. Like he kind of probably needed to prove himself a little bit. You know, he's doing those things in the decorative arts. He's making patterns for like wallpapers and designing stamps in addition to his prints and everything like that. But he's doing stuff that's very labor intensive. We talked about how he learned woodcuts. Mm -hmm. A woodcut print is not an easy thing to produce. Uh, When we talk about woodcuts, we're talking about a block of wood that you carve an image into to use as a stamp. And then when you see a multicolored woodcut design, each color on there was a separate block of wood that had to be carved so that it fit in perfectly with the other st- with the other carved images. So like the piece that we're going to be talking about today, uh, circle limit 3, it was a woodcut print. He had to make 5 blocks of wood that were carved out so that they would fit together and then carefully print one and then like go to the next block and line it up just right to print and stamp on top of that paper again, Mm. go to the third block, line it up just right. I mean, there are a lot of potential points of failure in that. And it takes a lot of care and attention and he did it very, very well. He did it obviously better than a lot of people, which is why he started to gain an audience. I think part of his audience was like in the academic community, people who love math and geometry and tessellations. I mean, he's getting into like parabolic geometry and stuff. Like I never went beyond Euclidean myself, Um, not my area of expertise, but mathematicians saw what he was doing 
and they loved what he was doing because they're they're like yes another quiet you know nerdy guy who's doing stuff that like i understand i understand what he's putting down there even if escher himself didn't always understand what he was putting down there with the the mathematic stuff um well, and that's that's what I if I could just say it real, real quick, like, that's what I love about it is that um, it's you know I, I tell students and teachers all the time like math is the real world represented you know in in numbers or we represent the real world. It's not just a number system that we just play around with and calculate. And so he's like revealing that there is a natural math two things to to visuals to art you know and and it he, you don't have to have studied it and gone to deep levels of learning with it in order to produce the works he's doing because naturally math is there um and it's in us and it, it's part of our world and even tessellations themselves are we've they've seen it like on coastlines and such like that that it's like you know you he's not this mathematician who was also an artist he was just an artist who could find the math um if that makes any sense no it it, it does because a lot of our world is sort of Math is how we come to understand the math and science are how we come to understand our world and what's going on. And even if you don't understand all of those systems and structures, you do have some intuitive sense of what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, before Isaac Newton was writing about gravity, people understood that they weren't going to fall up. And so Escher was one of those people who was like understanding and describing what he's seeing visually even if he was still struggling to put together the pieces of like the underlying math behind it. I love what you did there with putting together the pieces. That was really, yeah, that was really good. You like that? Yeah. Putting together pieces. Yeah. With the guy did tessellations. I, and I also love that his following his groups that followed him were yeah. mathematicians. So just get that image in your head. Like, and I know that we're stereotyping here and then psychedelics, people very into psychedelics and it's like this just and i know actually back then like those were actually probably had a lot of crossover but in our you know representation of those two groups probably traditionally we don't see them as as a a large crossover uh group so um i just love that 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 brought those two together yeah but i mean in the mid 20th century and beyond you know the university would be the place where those two overlap on the Venn diagram. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he did find some su- success speaking, lecturing at universities, um, 1950s and 60s. So people were starting to see him as a little bit of an intellectual, but also like in pop culture. Um, so he, like his... And I, I love this because there are some examples of people from very different worlds who appreciated his work. So, like, his House of Stairs piece captured the imagination of Roger Penrose, a mathematician. And he published this paper, Impossible Objects, a Special Type of Visual Illusion. And Penrose sent a copy to Escher. Escher replied by sending him a litho of ascending and descending. You know, the stairs that kind of go look like they're constantly going up, but it goes in a loop. Um, Mm -hmm. And then I guess at some point Mick Jagger wrote him a fan letter (laughs) and MC Escher replied by saying, like, please don't address me by my first name, (laughs) (laughs) which I, I, I don't know if it was a sign that he didn't like his first name and that's why he went by MC or he just didn't want Mick Jagger to be so familiar with him. Either way, I find it delightful. Um, but I guess we've kind of been dancing around this. Let's let's get into our discussion of the piece for for this week. And this one I have is Circle Limit Three from 1959. He, by the title, I think it's probably you've already figured out. He made more than one Circle Limit piece. And this piece is a woodcut that he made, and mathematicians have described this as the best of the series, I think because of the accuracy of his parabolic arcs and stuff like that. But what do you see here? What's jumping out at you? What do you notice? Um, I mean, 
I so when I when I first saw that you were going to look at this piece, I was like, really? I had not seen this piece of Escher. I mean, admittedly. Um, and at first glance, if I could be totally honest, like I'm like, okay, primary colors and fish. And like at first, I'm like, okay, this like looks really cool. But then I'm drawn in more and more to the intricacy of how number one, it fits together, right? And but the the exponentially shrinking image of it that in the center there they're large and that they continue as they tessellate out to get smaller which a tessellation is usually like a repeated of the same objects and somehow he continues to do this manipulation of space that the eye can't tell where it totally got smaller at first like if you look deeper into it you can but like it just you don't realize how of how seamlessly he shrinks or increases the size. Yeah. And I, I think also when we talk about like how it's produced and the technical stuff there, it, typically a tessellation, uh, I would always teach students to take a square and make a template that you can trace and repeat or stamp into, into there. But if you look at this, at first those fish look symmetrical, but then when you look a little bit closer the the left side and the right side of each individual fish is not exactly mirrored because they have to shrink a little bit as it goes down with each repetition. Mm-hmm. And so so then you start to realize, oh, what he did was he kind of made not exactly a grid because he's not working with squares. It's a circular thing. And he's got these arcs that are sort of parabolic in, in their trajectory. But he those white lines that are cutting it apart, he's got those as guides. And then he's probably having to do a little bit of freehand work inside of the triangles and not quite squares, but the different um, segments, these different shaped segments that come together to make the design. And you start to realize like there's a lot more that has to be repeated very precisely, but also freehand because it's not a true repetition of the exact same shapes and the exact same proportions. Right. And, 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 and unlike some of the other works that I'm used to, this is all curves. Like this is all, like this is all arcs and it's that creates an even deeper intricacy. Like you can't grab out a ruler uh, to, to do this. And so I think that was also something that like really spoke to me. Yeah, and then when you stop to think about this as a woodcut and you understand that process and realize that we've got five colors here. We've got the black, the green, the blue, the red, the yellow, and the white is just the white of the paper, so that's just left in place. But he had to carve five blocks to, to line up properly. I mean, with that level of precision, that's... That's an amazing feat, just technically. I get it. So now he's got five different cuts. That's even five different more stamps that have stamps. to be printed one on the paper, then the next one, then the next one. Oh my one. gosh. And each print has to line up just right. You know, you have to get the stamp in just the right spot for it to match up. Two co- cups of coffee in, but it's not really. <laughs> it's not I'm like, yeah, is this a plate? What is this? <laughs> uh, looks like I broke something and I glued it back together. Um, I think I think that though is the best description of MC Escher's work. You're just like, what is this? Because yeah. at first you think you know, and then as you look more at those details, it's like I don't really understand what I'm looking at. I can't process this because he's making impossible realities he's creating stuff that feels on first glance correct and appropriate in terms of the perspective and other stuff like that but he's always shifting it he's always doing something that's a little bit off but it doesn't feel off at first glance and that's a really hard thing to do because normally we talk about like the uncanny valley that idea where something is just slightly off it's unsettling you know, mm-hmm. but his doesn't have that quality. His is just slightly off in this very deliberate way, 
it's like a magician. You know what I'm saying? Like he's altering your reality and your perception of things. And there's this clear and purposeful misdirection as opposed to like the accidental slightly off. Right. And they say like symmetry is beauty, right? Like that, that our brains, you know, even with faces or whatever, like we, we want to see symmetry in the world. Yeah. And yet all of his pieces that I like his later pieces, right? Not, I'm going to take the landscape yeah, out yeah. and the portraits out, but like all of his pieces that he's known for are these, um, they seem very symmetrical. Like as you, as you first, when you first look at them, you're like, Oh, that's, a great example of symmetry. No, no, that's not symmetrical. Uh, I can't, I can't put a line in. It doesn't work. And so I think it's, um, it's almost like he plays with that part of our brain that wants symmetry and then tries to find it, but it's not there. Like you're chasing a cloud, you know, it's, just, it keeps, it keeps, uh, vanishing. Yeah, like I would use this as an example of radial symmetry, but then, like I, like you said, when you try to put that axis or, I guess, several axes of symmetry, like it just – it's not quite there. Right. The fish aren't quite symmetrical and all that sort of stuff. Um, and still it works, it, it, which is – for me, as somebody who studies the arts and how these elements and how these principles come together, it shouldn't work. Right. Something that's something that that looks symmetrical but doesn't quite like that should be like when you play music and you're half a step away from harmonizing, mm -hmm. like that should be discordant and jarring, and he makes it work. And I, yeah. I, I you know, tip of the hat to him for that. And I'm wrapping it up. I want just a three point rating scale. And where should this hang? The Lou? Is this something to look at? The lab. the lab is this something to learn from, or the loop? British for the bathroom. Yeah, there's a the loop joke in there somewhere. Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. This is going to be a really non-committal response, but it belongs like everywhere. I mean, it belongs. It doesn't. It doesn't have a resignation of like this. That 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 this it, it deems it for here. Like I want it in the classroom. I want it in the hallways. I want it in a subway train station tiled. You know, I want it um, to to just bring someone's eye in anywhere um, to make someone pause and think. Um, I want it to be mosaic, though. I have to be ad ad admitted. I know it's a print, um, but. You want it to come full circle and go back to like those mosaics yeah. that he was inspired by. You want this right. created right. as tile work. I want this out and open to the public. I don't want it in a a, a museum per se. I'll, I'll say that. I don't want it stuck in a, in a room with a bunch of other pieces. I want it out and being seen by people in a public place. Yeah, I, I largely agree there. I'm... I'm going to say the museum for me, though, just because I think there's so much behind it and it's there's so much for us to learn from it. But also it's aesthetically pleasing and it's the kind of thing that I think should be preserved and people should go see in a museum to learn from for and, and appreciate for years to come. Like for me, a good museum piece is the kind that. I see and enjoy just at a surface level, but then there's more to it for me to explore and those different entry points and different takeaways from it. And so for me, this is one of those examples that I think he really hit on something that works on different levels. And I think when you said that, it made me realize what I want it to be is I want it to be in a contemplative spot, like, but I want it connected to the nature that he often so often pulls from and represents. I know this is not a nature piece per se. I mean, just because it's fish doesn't mean it's nature, but it, there is so much of this non symmetrical symmetry in our, in the world, like in nature itself, um, that I want to see it there. Yeah. And I, I think, I think probably what you're getting at is, the connection that I also drew to it sort of at a subconscious level, like right off the bat, I see that radial symmetry and I associate it with like mandalas, which are very well known in, you know, like 
in Eastern religions, Buddhism, we see those mandalas that have the radial symmetry, but we see four four figures here that are repeated, which kind of reminds me of like the structure of mandalas with the four gates that are rep- a sort of abstracted representation of the universe. And it has those spiritual connotations to it. Mm-hmm. And I, I think, you know, he's not creating a mandala, but in some ways it has that quality to it where I look at it and I, I get lost in it. And I, I think about those types of things, there's a meditative aspect to that repetition and the the balance of it mm-hmm. and the way that things these radial designs feel so just visually satisfying. You know? Mm-hmm. Symmetry is visually satisfying and radial symmetry to me even more so. And I think that that kind of lends itself to that meditative, contemplative aspect. Yeah. That's a really great way yeah. to put it. I like that. Yeah. Meditative. So I guess uh, I think I think we can agree Escher pretty rad. Yeah. Whether you're whether whether you're appreciating it for the nerdy math aspects or the trippy aspects of it, he's got something for everyone. And that that's hard to do. So um, thank you very much for taking the time to come talk to me on a Sunday morning about Pleasure. MC Escher. Always appreciate it. Thank you. This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted? If you found this tolerable, please like and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week in the show notes on Twitter at WoodArtEd and on the website whoartedpodcast.com podcast done.